Welcome to the Serious Computer Security Seminar from Purdue University. Our speakers today are from the uh, Naval Research Laboratory and the leader of the TOR project, Roger Dil Dingledine, and Paul Syverson will be participating in questions later on. Uh, the topic today is anonymous communication for government agencies, corporations, journalists, and you, or the abbreviated title here. Roger? Okay, I'm Roger. Um, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the system that we've been working on called Tor. How many people here have heard of Tor or uh, something like that? I've got a couple of, couple of hands. Yes, no. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so the basic idea for Tor is it's an overlay network on the Internet that lets people browse the web or instant message without people watching them learning where they're going or people watching the websites learning where they're coming from. Um, so there are lot of different pieces to it and I'll give you a, a couple of overviews. Feel free to interrupt me uh, during the talk if you've got questions or if I say something that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so we're a free software open source system uh, not encumbered by patents. Uh, you can get it and use it and change it and give it to your friends. Uh, it comes with a specification and a full and full documentation which means that you can actually uh, look at it and decide how it works and you can build your own compatible Tor client and server. Uh, it also means that a lot of researchers have uh, decided to build their own as a, as a test bed and whenever people are working on research papers I wonder if this anonymity attack works or I wonder if this defense works. Um, we're the standard in terms of uh, the thing to go out and test with these days. Uh, so there are a lot of research papers at, at big security conferences that say, uh, well, we thought of this new attack and we tried it against Tor and it worked or it didn't work. Usually they do work, um, which makes things, keeps things exciting from our perspective. Um, so there are a lot of servers out there. There are about 1,500 uh, relays, volunteer run relays around the world. Um, there are some number of users. It's hard to tell for sure because it's an anonymity system, but um, we're guessing maybe 200,000 people, a quarter million people are running Tor clients right now. Uh, so there are a lot of different uh, groups out there. Uh, I think uh, the US, Germany, and China are the, the top three by user base. Um, and we're pushing a lot of traffic, over a gigabit per second of traffic. I think that's, uh, that rivals Wikipedia and Hotmail in terms of the amount of traffic that they push. Um, we're, as of the end of 2006, an actual nonprofit, which uh, uh, means that we've organized. It's no longer just me and a couple of people, but now we've got a board of directors and other exciting things like that. Um, and we also have three full-time developers, which means that we actually have enough people working on the research angle of things and development and user support and uh, stuff like that. If any of you are interested in any of this, the stuff I talk about today, um, we could sure use some more volunteers and uh, more people doing research and development and design, all of that. Uh, one of the exciting things about Tor is that we've been funded by uh, such a diverse group of people. We started out being funded by the Navy, uh, the Department of Defense, and then we were funded by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a, a, a freedom of speech, freedom of expression, uh, civil liberties uh, organization in California. And uh, most recently, we've been funded by a U.S. government group called the International Broadcasting Bureau. They're the folks who run Voice of America and Radio Free Cuba, stuff like that. Uh, they've got some websites around the world that some people can't reach, and they'd like to fix that, and we sure wouldn't mind fixing that. Uh, so our focus lately has been on China and Iran and uh, folks in uh, oppressive corporations and the whole uh, set of examples there. Okay, um, so informally we all have some idea of what anonymity means. Uh, who wrote this blog post? Uh, who's been looking at my web pages? Who's been sending mail to the patent attorneys? Uh, a little bit more formally, we've got this notion of an anonymity set. There are a bunch of Alice's over there, and one of them did some transaction with Bob. Maybe they looked at his website, maybe they sent him mail, something like that. So the goal of an anonymity system is to make it the set of possible Alice's as large as we can. So that, that notion is called the anonymity set. Um, and the more Alice's there are that might have been doing the transaction, uh, the better off we are. Uh, and there are some mathematical ways we can look at that rather than just saying how many Alice's we can say what is, what's the probability distribution, how much entropy is there. Uh, but that's the basic intuition. Um, and there are a lot of different pieces of the threat model we need to look at. Uh, maybe uh, the attacker is watching Alice's local network connection. Uh, or maybe the attacker is watching Bob's network connection. Or he is Bob. He's maybe uh, CNN really curious about who's looking at his website. Um, and maybe the attacker is somewhere in the middle of the network, uh, part of the ISPs, part of the network, something like that. 
Uh, so these are the various threats that we might wonder about uh, when we're trying to design a system like that. If the attacker is in all the places for these red boxes, uh, we're in bad shape, and I'll explain that later on. Um, but at least we have some sense of the various places that we might uh, see attacks from. So anonymity isn't crypto. I talk to a lot of corporations and they say, uh, well, that's great, but, but we have a VPN, so we don't need this anonymity stuff. Um, and encryption is useful. It's uh, certainly a good thing to have. But even if you're encrypting your content, somebody watching it can still figure out who you're talking to, how much you're saying, when you're talking to them. And that's what uh, a lot of people use for traffic analysis when they're trying to figure out uh, who would be exciting to look at and how, who should we focus more on. There's plenty of space if you want to come in and sit. Feel free. There are seats. Uh, there's one there, one over here. So um, anonymity isn't crypto. That's uh, uh, something to, to think about. Another one, um, anonymity is not steganography. I talk to a lot of people who say, uh, I'm so happy that I'm running Tor now because now nobody knows I'm using the internet. Uh, that's not true. People watching you can still figure out that you're you know, sending packets back and forth. And if they look really carefully, they might be able to learn that you're talking to a Tor server and, and recognize the protocol you're using. Uh, so we don't try to prevent uh, people from doing that. We just try to protect against somebody learning that Alice is talking to Bob. So it's the linkability of both of them. Somebody might learn that Alice is using Tor. That's fine, as long as they don't know what she's doing with it. So far, so good? Okay, so there are a lot of other versions of what anonymity might be. Uh, if you talk to the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing systems like Freenet, uh, they have a notion of plausible deniability. Yes, somebody asked me for the file, and yes, I gave them the file, but, but it might not have been me. I mean, maybe I was just relaying it for somebody else. Um, and we talked to, uh, and, and yes, maybe I, I, somebody asked me for the file, and I gave them the file again, but it might not have been me. Maybe I was relaying it. And by the 18th transaction that this person's involved in, each time claiming, well, maybe I was relaying it, uh, statistics works. Uh, it becomes more and more unconvincing to claim that, that, that Maybe they were just relaying it for somebody else. So we'd like something a bit stronger than that. I also talked to various uh, one-hop proxies, corporations that, that help anonymize your traffic for you. They're just one computer out there. They promise to keep it safe. So they start out saying, well, we promise we won't look at any of the traffic. OK, OK, we, we look at the traffic. We promise we won't remember any of the traffic. OK, OK, we, we, we write it all down, but we promise we won't tell anybody anything we see. Um, I, I don't know what the fourth sentence is there, but I'd like something stronger than that also. Um, and then there's, I didn't write my name on it, and isn't the internet already anonymous? Uh, hopefully I'll explain later on um, why it isn't. So part of the fun of this is all the different organizations who care about privacy or uh, however we phrase it. So when I'm talking to my parents and my grandparents, I work on privacy systems. When I'm talking to Google and Walmart, I work on communication security or network security systems. And when I'm talking to the government, I work on traffic analysis resistant communication networks. And part of the fun of this is learning how to phrase it for each different organization. If you go to the government and you say, uh, I've got some privacy for you, they say, oh, I don't, I don't need privacy. That's, that's dumb. And if you go to you know, a corporation and you say, we've got anonymity for you, then they say, oh, that's scary. I don't, I don't want any of that. But if you learn how to phrase it, of course, you know, corporations need security and governments need to resist traffic analysis. Um, then part of the fun of this is getting all those organizations into the same network so that they can blend together, so that they can get uh, security or privacy or anonymity uh, from each other. So a few more examples of uh, uh, use cases. These are folks who've come up to us and explained how happy they are that Tor exists because they've uh, fill in the blank. Uh, so one example, uh, bloggers. A few years ago, there were a couple of people in California who uh, speculated about what Apple was going to come up with next. And it turns out they were right. So they put that on their blog, and then Apple came after their ISP and said, who are those people? We want to make sure that they shut up. Um, and we could talk about maybe Apple should have asked its own employees, OK, guys, who leaked the information. Um, but I'd like to live in a world where we've got the, the freedom of speech, freedom of expression to be able to, to, to put up something like that on the website, and we should be able to keep it up. Uh, another example, eight-year-old Alice. Um, let's say your sister logs into an instant messaging chat room. Before she says anything, before she even starts typing, she immediately broadcasts her IP address to everybody else in the chat room. 
And it's not so hard these days to turn an IP address into a set of geolocation coordinates. And it's not so hard these days to turn a set of geolocation coordinates into a, a Google satellite photograph of the house that she's in. Um, maybe in a few years we'll have those with real-time updates. So you can say, is there a car parked out front right now or not? All of this happens before she says anything, before she decides to follow your advice or not about, uh, I live in West Lafayette and at this street corner, or, um, stuff like that. So there's something fundamentally wrong there. We'd like to make it so that by default, you don't broadcast all this information about yourself. And then you can choose, yes, I want to tell you about myself, or no, I, I don't want to uh, provide more details. Um, another example, sick Alice. Maybe uh, Alice wants to learn more about diabetes. Maybe her grandmother has diabetes. And she's, looking about, she's learning about it from work or from school. And she doesn't want the, the network operator people to say, hey, she's looking at, at cancer websites or diabetes websites. She's going to cost us more in healthcare next year. Let's fire her now. Um, that sort of thing happens uh, pretty often in, in industry. Um, that's a shame. It'd be nice to fix that. Uh, consumer Alice. Uh, let's say you go to, let's say you, you, you look at Amazon all the time, they build huge databases about you. Uh, there's a corporation called DoubleClick, uh, Google's building lots of databases. Uh, AOL a little while ago uh, published like 14 million uh, search queries and they allegedly not anonymized them. But they didn't do it very well. They just, you know, crossed off the IP address and put in a, a pseudonym, a number instead. So people started looking through the list and saying, well, this person, and they're anonymous, so we don't know who they are, searched for um, pharmacies near 123 Main Street, West Lafayette, Indiana. And then they also searched for all these other things. I wonder who that was. Uh, so that, that's a, a few examples of, of large databases. Uh, maybe another example, uh, you, go, you go to buy car insurance in a few years. And your insurance company says, do you like to race cars? And you say no. And they say, what about that book you looked at on Amazon three years ago? Is that a crazy example? They've got the database. They're building all of these databases about us. Uh, I don't know what they're going to use them for down the road. And uh, so part of our goal with Tor is to give uh, individuals and also corporations and governments the choice. Am I going to get stuck in all these databases? Am I going to keep putting more and more of my information into these databases and we don't know what people are going to do with them? Or am I going to uh, choose for myself what I'll, I'll reveal in each case? Um, and then there's oppressed Alice. Um, maybe Alice is in China or Iran uh, and they're not able to look at certain websites. Uh, Tor gives them the ability to, to come out uh, wherever they want to. Uh, another example of that, I was doing an interview with a person from the LA Times a couple of years ago. And the LA Times contracts out to one of these companies that helps keep them safe on the internet and they couldn't look at the Tor website because that was scary. And the LA Times reporter was really angry that his uh, local network people wouldn't let him look at a website that he was trying to write an article about. Uh, so that's uh, a few more examples. Uh, so those are uh, some examples of the individuals who, who care about this stuff. There are also some uh, uh, examples of the attackers we might worry about. Um, the hostile Bob is the easy one. That's the intuitive one. Um, I sell the logs. I collect large databases. Anybody who wants to buy them, I'm happy to sell them. Um, I've read an, an article a little while ago about uh, cable modem providers selling uh, click-throughs from uh, click logs from all of their customers. Um, and they just collect them. I don't know if Comcast was one, but there are a couple of other big ones that just collect everything all their customers click and they sell them. And they're not very targeted logs, so they can't sell them for very much. But hey, you know, 50 cents per person per day is, a, is better than zero cents per person per day. So you might as well collect them and sell them. Uh, I don't know when uh, this is going to come out and a lot of people will be upset by it or maybe we're all happy to be put in databases and sold. Um, maybe nobody will complain. We'll find out. Um, so that's the, the easy one, uh, the hostile Bob. I sell the logs. But then there's the slightly more subtle one, uh, the incompetent Bob. I put all the logs in a truck and I sent them across the country and turns out they didn't arrive. Oops, sorry. I don't know where they are. Um, and we hear an, a new story every week from a, a new company in California that just lost 30 million names and addresses and social security numbers and credit card numbers. Um, and it's always California we hear about because they passed the law saying if you lose personal information about a citizen of the state of California, then you have to notify them. 
Um, so we're hearing more and more organizations notifying people. And other states are saying, hey, wait a minute, uh, I should have a law like that. I should, our citizens should be notified too. Um, last I checked, the federal government was thinking about uh, passing a law outlawing laws like this because enough corporations had lobbied them saying that's really a hassle on our part and, and could you, you know, make it so that we don't have to report these things. Um, so we'll find out where that goes. And then there's the indifferent Bob. Uh, I collect the logs and, you know, I wasn't going to sell them. I wasn't going to give them out. But, you know, this guy offered me 20 bucks and they're not my secrets. So, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll give them out. Uh, so these are some examples of the, the different things that, that individuals uh, are concerned about on the Internet. Uh, okay, corporations care about this stuff for the same reasons, but they phrase it a little bit differently. Um, maybe you want to check out the competition's website without having to know exactly how long you spend on each page. Uh, I worked at a startup a couple of years ago, and one of my jobs every evening was to collate the web logs and send that to the salespeople. And so they would know... Uh, which people had spent how many minutes looking at which product pages so they'd know exactly who to call back the next day and say, a little bird told me that you're interested in buying this, let me tell you more about it. Uh, so companies aren't really that excited about uh, broadcasting all that information to their ISP and to their competitors. Um, another more extreme example, I was talking to a, a major hardware vendor uh, a couple of years ago and uh, they were looking at their competition's website and it turns out they got a different answer through Tor than they did going directly from their IP addresses. And that's because the, the competition had set up their, their web server saying, if you're coming from over here, give them this page, otherwise give them the real page. And they had no idea that was happening until uh, suddenly they, they, they tried showing up from different places. So that's an example where the internet isn't flat. Um, another example of that is Google. They give you a different answer depending on where in the world you're coming from. Um, not only do they say, well, you probably want the coffee shop down the street from you in Italy, but they also say, well, you probably want pages in Italian. And you probably don't want to see anything that the Italian government doesn't want you to see. Um, each of these countries has a different list of uh, pages that, that they're not allowed to show you, depending on what country you're coming from. Um, and then maybe there's a compromise network. Uh, do you want to buy a list of Alice's suppliers? Where does Ford buy its tires from? Um, what are the engineering department's favorite search terms? Um, another example of this, uh, you guys know about monster.com, right? The, the job search site. Um, let's imagine all the engineers at Cisco are looking for a new job today. Who knows this information first? Does Monster sell it? Should they sell it? Would we even know? So maybe companies would like to protect that sort of information in terms of the, the origin of communications for their uh, employees. Okay, so that's corporations. Law enforcement also use TOR. They use it for pretty much the same reasons, but they phrase it a little bit differently. Uh, maybe you want to do an uh, investigate a website and you don't want to have .mil or .gov show up in the, in the web logs. Maybe you want to do a, sti a sting operation. Maybe you want to show up on an instant messaging site or a chat room and say, I'm eight years old and I'd really like to meet you at the street corner. Turns out that doesn't work very well when you show up with a .gov address. People catch on. Um, I was talking to some FBI folks in Indianapolis a little while ago, and they were explaining that, yeah, they, they could go after this organized crime group that they learned about, but would my family really be safe if I do that? Why don't I just leave them alone? And that sucks. I don't want to live in a world where the police decide that it's not worth their, their risk or their time uh, going after the real criminals because uh, maybe they'll retaliate. Uh, and then turning it around, anonymous tips. Uh, I was chatting with the folks who run the CIA anonymous tip line a little while ago. And the way it works is you go to CIA.gov and you click on, I want to submit an anonymous tip. Uh, maybe there should be more to it than that. And, you know, they, they're, they're not completely crazy over there. They, they realize that they should do encryption. So now the way it works is the nice guy in Iraq goes into the Internet Cafe, and now he has an encrypted conversation with CIA.gov. I'm not sure this is actually any better. Uh, so wouldn't it be nice if we had some sort of uh, privacy, security, traffic analysis resistant anonymity system uh, to, to solve that sort of thing? Okay, governments... Again, for the same reasons, but they phrase it differently. Uh, what would you bid for a list of Baghdad IP addresses that get email from .gov? 
Anybody else out there interested in that information? Um, what does the CIA Google for? Google knows. The CIA's ISP knows. A lot of tier one ISPs in the middle know. I guess that means AT&T knows, and I guess if we believe the news, that means NSA knows. Um, what other organizations out there are, can keep track of this sort of thing? And does the CIA really want to, to broadcast all of that? Uh, so those are a few examples. The basic idea here is you can't get anonymity by yourself. If we just had the, the cancer survivor anonymity system, um, then it wouldn't work because everybody coming out of it, you'd know what they were using it for. Uh, so the goal is to take all these different groups and blend them into the same system so that they can get security uh, with each other. So far, so good? OK. And yes, bad people need anonymity too. But if they're willing to break the law, they can get much better anonymity than Tor can give them. If you're willing to break the law, you should steal a cell phone and use it and throw it in a ditch. You should break into computers in Korea and China and Idaho and route through them. In fact, um, there's a whole taxonomy of bad people on the internet. That's, this is a separate talk that we could get into. But the basic idea is you start with your uh, Trojans and your viruses and your exploits. And from there, you build your bot networks or your zombie networks. And these are made up of cable modems and other systems around the US and Europe, uh, just random people, mostly running Windows, um, vulnerable to all sorts of things. And once you've got your, your set of you know 100,000 or a million compromised computers, then you profit do all sorts of things. Espionage, DDoS, extortion. Uh, we, re we hear stories periodically about uh, casinos in the Caribbean where uh, they're making a lot of money online and some guy shows up and knocks them off the network for four hours. And then he stops and they come back up and he sends them a polite mail saying, yeah, that was me. Here's my Swiss bank account. I want 10 million US or I'm going to do it again. And they do the math, and the math says 10 million is cheap compared to going off the network for a week, so sounds good. And it turns out that $10 million goes a long way in Russia. So these guys are, uh, it's, a, it's a great business model for them. Um, and then spam and phishing and so on. Um, if you've ever gotten mail saying guaranteed bulletproof hosting, the way that works is they set up your website on 1,000 cable modem computers around the US. And so 10 of them get cleaned up. Who cares? There are still plenty more. Uh, so that's a, a separate talk. But um, if you're willing to break the law, bad people on the internet, they're doing fine. They've got great opportunities for anonymity, whereas the good guys, individuals, corporations, law enforcement, government, they don't have very many options. So bad guys are doing great. Good guys have nothing. Uh, that's what we're trying to fix. IP addresses are fine identifiers. I shouldn't have to say this, but I figure it's, it's worth repeating. Um, if, you, uh, if you come from a specific IP address and you visit some hot linked ad with double click, and then you log into your Amazon account and look at car racing, and then you go to Wikipedia and you post about jump roping and astrophysics, pretty quickly you're building a, a profile of what sort of person you are. And we can imagine combining these with uh, brick and mortar profiles of uh, various databases people have. And, and maybe you can identify uh, what state they're from, or maybe even more details than that. Um, I, I shouldn't have to say that IP addresses are, are a fine identifier. Um, but I was at a talk that uh, Google was giving to a bunch of CIA folks a few years ago. Um, and at, at the end of the talk, uh, one of the CIA people said, so do you, do you collect any information about the, the people who use Google? And with a perfectly straight face, the vice president of whoever she was said, no, we, we don't collect any personally identifying information. It's not like we collect your name or your phone number. We just collect your IP address. And about half of the people in the audience said, oh, good, great, thanks. That's what I wanted to know. And about half of the people in the audience said, wait a minute, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't, I'm not sure I like that answer. Um, and I was actually chatting with some folks who were working on a new uh, bill for the US. The, periodically, people are working on uh, uh, laws saying that it's illegal to help China oppress their citizens and stuff like that. And turns out there's a legal definition of personally identifying information, and it excludes IP address. So the woman at Google was telling the truth. They don't collect any personally identifying information. They just collect your IP address. I don't know if that means the law should change at some point so it reflects reality, or I guess we'll find out how that works uh, down the road. OK, so that was the first half. That was 
uh, who uses this stuff and, and why and, and what do they care about. Um, the second half is more of a how do we actually build one of these and what are the problems there. Uh, so we're not the first anonymity system out there. There are a bunch of other systems. Probably the key point here is the dotted line, the stuff, the low latency versus high latency. In a low latency anonymity system, the goal is to get the, the traffic from the web browser to the web server or vice versa pretty quickly. If you want an instant message or web browse, you want to do it uh, such that the traffic gets from one end of the network to the other pretty quickly so the user doesn't get upset and leave. Um, whereas in a high latency system, you're able to, maybe it's for email or something, and the user is willing to wait three or four hours before the mail arrives. Um, in a high latency system, theoretically, you can get a lot higher security because you're, you're delaying these messages and batching and reordering and stuff. Whereas in a low latency system, uh, the amount of, of theoretical security we can get isn't as strong. Um, so the, the key difference is what's called the end-to-end -end correlation attack. The key difference is uh, in a low latency system, there's a certain attack, a, a timing attack that works pretty well. The idea is if I'm watching Alice's connection and I'm watching Bob's connection, I see something come out of Bob and I see something very similar arrive at Alice half a second later. Um, and if I you know, watch these things back and forth for a little while, I can become pretty convinced that in fact Bob is talking to Alice and Alice is talking to Bob. Uh, so for a low latency system, uh, we give up on that attack. We accept that attack. Uh, and that's because if we want to make the attack not work, we need to add, this is a, still an open research question, but we theorize that we need to add uh, so much latency and so much overhead um, that it won't be a low latency anymore. Um, so on the other hand, for a high latency system, uh, the goal is even if you're watching Alice and Bob, the stuff you see coming out of Bob is not obviously correlatable to the stuff you see going into Alice. Um, and the reason that is is because you're willing to wait several hours and, and maybe 100 people have sent email over the course of those several hours. So you're not sure which of those 100 are the ones that, that line up. Um, so why do we focus on low latency then if there's this horrible attack? Uh, the answer is it comes down to the number of users. How many people in the world are willing to to, uh, would like to have better privacy, better anonymity, better security for their web browsing. Many millions of people. How many people in the world are willing to wait four hours for their email to maybe arrive? Uh, turns out not very many. So even though the high latency systems are in theory more secure, in theory they can provide better security, um, if you don't have any users, then in practice you're not going to you're not going to have the anonymity set. You're not going to be able to provide the security. So we're not choosing between a fast system with low security and a slow system with high security. We're choosing between fast and slow with low security in both cases. Uh, and that makes the choice easier. Uh, go where the users are. Anonymity loves company. OK, so how do we build one of these? The easy answer is you get a computer, you set it up somewhere, maybe in San Diego, and you route all the traffic through it. So Alice 1 is showing up saying, uh, please give me the front page of Voice of America. And Alice 2 shows up and says, please show me indie media. And the relay takes all those questions, goes to the websites, fetches the answer, and hands them back. Um, and that's great. It's easy to set up. It's easy to understand. But what if there's an attacker anywhere in the system? Maybe there's an attacker watching Alice 3's network. And he watches Alice 3 say, uh, Dear Relay, please send me this page from, from this website. So that's no good, because the, now there's a, a single place on the network where you can go to learn uh, what Alice is doing, to link Alice to Bob. So we use encryption. Um, and now there's an SSL connection from Alice to the relay. And it doesn't matter if you're watching that connection. You still can't read the actual bytes that they're sending back and forth. Um, and this is how most commercial proxies work. But there's still a problem here. What about that big central point of failure in the middle? What happens if you uh, go and you bribe the janitor, or you pay them 20 bucks, or you send a subpoena, or you send a guy named Guido on an airplane, or, uh, or maybe you, you know, get a job as the janitor, or you go look uh, at, at the, the wires going in and out of the building. Um, the list goes on and on in terms of uh, how a central point of failure might be a bad move uh, for anonymity. And you can also eavesdrop the system. If you can uh, get a hold of you know, the network connection, you can see the, the packets coming in, you can see the packets going out, uh, you can line them all up. One place is good enough to break the whole thing. So the goal for Tor 
is distributed trust. The idea is to spread out the connection so that no single point is able to learn both Alice and Bob. Yes, if R1 is bad, he knows Alice is using Tor, but he doesn't know what she's doing. And if R3 is bad, he knows somebody's talking to Bob, but he doesn't know who. And if they're both bad and they're colluding together, we're screwed. But at least we're doing better than one, one point of failure. So that means that the security that Tor gives you uh, comes from how big the network is, how diverse and dispersed the servers are. If we can get you know, 1,500 different servers all around the world in different places, then as the network grows, the number of attackers who are able to be in both of these places shrinks. Um, so as we grow larger and larger, there are not as many attackers who are able to be in the right places to beat Tor. That's the, that's the goal. Uh, what sort of background do people have on crypto? If I say ephemeral Diffie-Hellman, stuff like that, will you stare at me blankly? Looks like, okay, sounds good. Um, so I'll give you the basic overview of how the, the crypto works uh, in terms of what security properties we get. Uh, so the basic idea, Alice is going to pick her path through the network, and I'll tell you later how she does that. And she's going to connect to the first guy and establish uh, a session key. So there are two properties that we're looking for here. One of them is um, nobody who watches the traffic going over this link can read it once they've established the session key. Uh, another property is uh, Alice, Alice convinces herself that she's talking to the right person. She's talking to R1. That's done with public key crypto. Um, and the other property is once this connection goes away, once they both throw away uh, the, the material on each side, it doesn't matter if you've logged what goes over it. Uh, you can't break into one of them and, and force them to, to reveal what was sent. Once the circuit gets closed, once, we, once they all stop talking about uh, this particular connection, um, it doesn't matter if you've logged the traffic going back and forth. Okay, so she establishes a session key with R1, and from there she's going to write another packet encrypted with this green key saying, uh, Dear R1, please extend this circuit to R2. And from there she's going to do the same key exchange and establish a yellow key with R2. So this means that uh, R1 can't read the traffic going between R2 and Alice because it's encrypted with this key. Um, and at this point, she's going to uh, extend the circuit to R3 by writing a little message to R2, wrapping it up in both of these keys, the yellow one and the green one, and then sending it on. This guy will pull off one layer and say, well, this isn't for me. I can't read it. I'll send it on. And then R2 will pull off a layer and say, well, I don't know who Alice is, but, but whoever she is, she wants me to uh, connect to extend this circuit to R3. And at that point, Alice has done what's called, she's established a circuit. So she's got three different keys talking to, to, to these three different servers. Um, at this point, she's going to actually, she's going to hang out, wait, her Tor client will wait with a few of these circuits open, and eventually there will be an actual application request. Uh, she's going to click on cnn.com or something. And then her Tor client will say, oh, I have a, a request. I'm going to take a circuit that's available, maybe the one we just built, and I'm going to write a little request saying, please connect to cnn.com port 80. And I'm going to wrap that up in the blue key and the yellow key and the green key and send it down the circuit. And each one's going to pull off one layer until R3 reads it and says, I don't know who that is, but they want me to talk to CNN. I'll, I'll connect them. And at that point, Alice has basically a, a TCP stream being proxied all the way from Alice to Bob. And then they can just talk back and forth like normal. So once you've got one of these circuits, you can also connect to several different destinations at the same time over the same circuit. Uh, this is really important. Uh, for example, if you're going to AOL and they've got 71 tiny little pictures, you don't want to build 71 different circuits for each of those. Uh, instead, you want to use the same circuit for 71 different TCP streams. Uh, so that's an example where it's good. You want to keep using the same circuit for a lot of different things. But it can, it can also be bad to keep using the same circuit for a lot of different things. Because if you go to Amazon and you look about car racing and you go to Wikipedia and you post about jump roping and astrophysics, all the stuff I was talking about a few slides ago, R3 doesn't know who you are, but they know whoever that is they're doing all these different things. And it can start building a pseudonymous profile. I don't know who it is, but they're interested in this and this and this. And maybe pretty quickly it can start to recognize who that might be. So there's a, a trade-off there in terms of we really want to 
reuse the circuits so we don't have to spend time doing public key crypto, but we don't want to reuse them for too long. And there's an open research question about uh, what the right trade-off is. Right now, we, uh, we use the same circuit for 10 minutes before rotating to a new one. Uh, 10 minutes is probably way too long. Um, but if we make it a lot shorter than that, then all the Tor servers spend all their time uh, spending their CPU doing public key operations, and then they get angry and stop. So there are a lot of different uh, sides to that trade-off. So far, so good? Great. OK, so the Tor client is a SOX proxy. Uh, SOX is a very simple protocol. You just connect and you say, here's the address and port I want. And it says, OK, I'll connect you. Uh, so the, the main point of this slide, uh, you can use SOX for uh, web browsing, for IRC, for instant messaging, for SSH. But uh, you need more than just uh, communications anonymity or connection anonymity. There's also a separate notion of data anonymity. And that's where this little green box called uh, Web Scrubber comes in. If you use your Internet Explorer directly with Tor, Tor will do its job. It will anonymize your IP address. Nobody will know what IP address you're coming from. But your Internet Explorer will send all sorts of exciting HTTP headers. It will say, I'm Internet Explorer version 4.7, patch level 3, build 27. And it'll say, I really prefer Japanese, but you know German and, uh, and, and some other thing are, are fine uh, alternatives. And it'll say, the exact number of pixels by the exact number of pixels of my window is this. And it'll say, here are all the cookies that I've ever seen from websites that are, look kind of like you. Um, oh, you, you've got Flash for me? I love running Flash. Uh, so all of these different application level things can be a danger for your anonymity also. Um, Flash and Java and stuff like that are a particularly uh, bad worry because they run arbitrary stuff on your local computer. <laughs> Um, so, for example, if you are, if 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 Alice is is willing to run Java applets, then she'll connect to the website, and the website sends back a Java applet that looks up her IP address, and then sends it back over Tor. So Tor is doing its job; it's anonymously sending that IP address back. Nobody knows where it's coming from, but that might not be what Alice has in mind. Um, so uh, there are a lot of application level things that we need to worry about in terms of. Uh, uh, are we leaking information about our computer or our location or our network connection or something like that uh, separately from, from Tor's job? So there's a, a program called Provoxy that sort of tries to do a little bit of this. Firefox is getting a lot better at it. Um, and we've got a new uh, uh, plugin, a new extension for Firefox called Tor Button that uh, tries to tackle a lot of the application level stuff. Um, I'll show you the interface later on if we've got time. But basically, in the bottom of your browser, it simply says Tor enabled in green. And you click it, and it says Tor disabled in red. And that's the whole interface. But behind the scenes, it's doing a lot of other smart things that try to keep you safe. Another point, we've got a, a control protocol that we added a few years ago. And that means that um, you can connect over a local uh, socket that looks sort of like SMTP, and say things like, uh, please let me know if any important things happen. I'll display them to the user. Or please let me know what the current configuration is, because I'd like to change it. Or please change the current configuration to this. And that means that people can write uh, separate GUIs in uh, Microsoft Visual C Sharp++ or whatever the, the latest fad is. And they can be separate from Tor. Tor can still uh, be written in C and be really portable. But you can have a controller uh, for whatever platform you have in mind. And there's a, a nice fellow at RPI who's written a Tor controller called Vidalia that uh, has uh, slick graphics and it graphs how much bandwidth you're using and it's got a, a map of the world and you can see your circuits being mapped and stuff like that. Okay, another point. Usability for server operators is key. Since our security comes from having so many servers around the world, we really need to make it easy for people to decide, I, I, I'd like to run a server now. So a couple of ways to do that. Uh, rate limiting, we let you say, I want to provide only 40 kilobytes a second or only 200 kilobytes a second. I don't want to provide Purdue's whole network connection for this. Um, and then uh, another half of that is there are a lot of people with ISP colo accounts where they get uh, 60 gigabytes per month. So we have it set up so you can say, use, 60, use, use 55 gigabytes per month and then go to sleep until next month and then do it again. So there are a lot of different uh, uh, features that we've added to, 
uh, account for various bandwidth accounting mechanisms. Um, so another piece is exit policies. Every Tor server has an exit policy that specifies these are the IP addresses and ports I'm willing to connect to. So a lot of them say, um, I'll, I'll just use the default. Uh, feel free to do web browsing and instant messaging and stuff, but, but please no default uh, file sharing ports. Uh, some of them say, I just want to be a, a relay. I'm just going to relay stuff from Tor to Tor. I don't want to be an exit. I'm going to be a non-exit relay. Um, and then a few of them say, I, I run an ISP. I'm running a Tor server. I am my ISP. I'm just going to open it all up. I'll do anything. Um, so the, the fact that there's this variety means that we can handle people uh, who aren't in a position to deal with abuse complaints, and we can handle people who are. Um, of course, we need some exit relays because uh, otherwise you can't get out of the network. We need somebody to be that, that third hop. But as long as a third of the nodes in the network are willing to be that third hop, um, then it works. Okay, so how do we learn about the other servers in the system? Uh, here are some ways not to do that. One approach, and a lot of the peer-to-peer the -peer systems work this way, is Alice goes up to any server and says, so who are all the Tor servers? And that server, if she chose badly, grins and rubs his hands and says, here are 1,500 of my favorite friends in Venezuela. And Alice, being software, uh, is perfectly happy to use that as the Tor network. She has no idea that she's just been attacked. Uh, so that's, that's one way we don't want to do it. There are some more subtle issues when it comes to anonymity, though. Uh, let's imagine we've got a lot of different servers out there. We've got so many servers that we can't tell every Alice about every server. So one approach would be, we'll just download a subset. Every user will fetch a random 50% of the directory of the, of the, the set of servers out there. And, uh, and then you know they'll only have to use half of it. But the problem here is, if I'm an attacker, and I see that Alice 1 fetches these two-thirds of the nodes, and I see that Alice 2 fetches these two-thirds of the nodes, and I see a connection coming out of this, I know it wasn't Alice 1. So I've now partitioned uh, the set of users, and I can ignore some of them. Um, so this is a, a trivial version of the attack. You might say, well, yeah, but that doesn't seem so bad. Uh, the problem is that if you do this again and again, you can very quickly intersect. You can discard lots of users until you're down to, to just the user that, that uh, that was the one making the connection. So this is a not very well understood attack at this point, but it's something that worries us in terms of how do we uh, make sure that, that we're giving out uh, network information in a uniform way so that all the users are going to behave the same way. That's where the anonymity comes from. As long as they're making uh, the same sorts of decisions on the same sorts of data, uh, then they're safe. So how do we do it? Uh, the first answer was there are directory servers. There are five places around the internet, and they keep track of all the servers, and their addresses and their public keys uh, ship with Tor, so you know you've got the right one. Um, so the way it works is all the servers would write little server descriptors. They would sign them. They would include address and ports and exit policies and keys and stuff like that. And then they would send them to the trusted directories who would build a huge list and sign it, saying, at this time, these were all the servers in the network. Don't believe anything else. And then those would get cached all throughout the network, and Alice would fetch it from a cache. There were a couple of problems with that. One of them is most of that is duplicate information. Most of the directory that you get now and the directory you get in two hours, they mostly overlap. So it's a shame that you have to download all that stuff again. The other problem is, what happens if one of these guys lies? There are five of them. We break into one, and we have him list 1,500 computers in Venezuela, and now we're back where we were before. Uh, so what we've changed it to is we have those five, and those five directory authorities, and they're going to gather all the lists of server descriptors and talk amongst each other and build what's called a network status. And the idea is that network status just lists Little snapshots. Here's the hash of the descriptor you should look for. Here's the hash of the key you should expect to find. Here's his IP address and port. Here's whether I think he's running or not. So they would build little 200 kilobyte blobs signed by all five of them, or at least as many of them as are willing to sign it. And then Alice will go fetch that network status, and she just has to fetch that new summary of the, of the network. And at that point, she knows what descriptors are out there, and she can go anywhere, maybe to some of the caches, and fetch those. Um, so that's the, 
the, the basic idea. We can talk a little bit more details, but I've got five minutes left, so I'm going to uh, keep on busting through material. Feel free to interrupt me if you've got uh, questions. So we're currently the uh, largest strong anonymity network ever deployed, or the longest distributed the largest distributed trust anonymity uh, ever network ever deployed. We've got uh, I don't know 1,500 servers, uh, quarter million users, hard to say for sure, uh, 150 megabytes a second or more of traffic. Um, a couple of problems. <clears throat> Turns out there are bad people on the internet, and. Tor can't tell the difference between when nice Alice shows up and tries to make a connection and jerk Alice shows up and tries to make a connection. Um, and it turns out that a lot of services on the internet uh, aren't really very good at authenticating their users or deciding whether they should let people uh, connect. So Slashdot had a problem with uh, folks showing up through Tor and writing Slashdot sucks. Uh, and eventually they decided that the best thing to do was uh, you can read Slashdot through Tor, but please don't post. We've got enough. Uh, enough of that. Uh, and Wikipedia ended up in the same issue, where they had uh, uh, a few people uh, who were very, very persistent showing up through Tor and writing Wikipedia sucks on the George Bush article or whatever they were doing. And, uh, and at that point, they said, OK, you can read Wikipedia, but, but you can't post. Um, and there's certainly another talk in there uh, about how we might deal with that. I've been chatting with the Wikipedia folks about this uh, weird new concept called authentication. Maybe they might have you know, accounts and you might log in. Um, and there, there are a lot more details to getting that right. Uh, but I guess the, the main point uh, that we're trying to work with them for is if there are currently IP addresses that you would block, you should add more roadblocks for them. You should make them solve seven CAPTCHAs, or you should force them to log in and, and prove their value. And if they're not, then hey, no, no roadblocks for the IP addresses that you already like. Um, there's another system out there called Nimble that some folks at Dartmouth are working on. And the idea is um, it gives you a blinded token, which is signed by somebody so that you can know it's a fresh token and so on. But it's, it isn't associated with this IP address. So that means you can show up at Wikipedia and you can say, here's my token, here's my proof. That you, haven't black, that you haven't banned or blacklisted this IP address yet, but you don't have to know the IP address. You can ban the token. You'll never hear from me again, but you can't uh, unveil my, my privacy. So that's some approach. Um, another success story, there are IRC networks out there who have problems with trolls showing up, and they you know, join 10 or 15 people uh, using Tor show up, and then they sidetrack you and, and derail the whole conversation. Uh, Freenode. Uh, first started saying, well, we're being attacked. We better ban Tor. Um, but then they said, we don't have to block all the Tor connections. All we have to do is label the Tor users as Tor users. We don't know who they are. They're anonymous. But now when you see a Tor user shows up, another Tor user shows up, a third Tor user shows up, now you can say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, I'm, I'm about to get attacked in that way that, that I saw before. So that, that was enough that the trolls have gone back to using their open proxies and their compromised computers and stuff like that, because it, it's no longer uh, as effective to attack that way. Um, so that's maybe a success story. Certainly <coughs> some ongoing uh, issues there in terms of how to, have, how to help uh, internet services interact with anonymous users. Another example, uh, Tor is great and all if you can reach the Tor network. But what happens if the Chinese firewall blocks connections to the Tor network? Um, they haven't done this yet. We can certainly talk about uh, sociological questions of, of why not. Uh, but when they do, um, how are we going to handle that arms race in terms of, of letting people be able to get to the Tor network so that they can read Google, so they can you know, read their web comics or whatever it is the firewall's blocking that week? Um, so the, the answer that we're, we've been working on for the past year is a system called Bridges. So the idea is we've got a few hundred thousand users out there. Can we give them a little button in Vidalia that says, help censored users? And if they click that button, now they turn into a relay, not in the main Tor network, not in the directory, not in anything you can look up, but in some separate database of, of volunteers just for being bridges. So the idea is the blocked user connects to, through the user into the main Tor network. So Alice doesn't have to be an exit node. She's just relaying traffic. And she doesn't have to relay very much, maybe 20 kilobytes a second is great for somebody in Iran who otherwise would be on a modem and doesn't have any ha, and is censored by his country. Um, so we've changed the arms race from how do we 
keep 1,500 public IP addresses out of the hands of the Chinese government, which is an impossible problem, to how do we take 100,000 IP addresses and give them out one at a time to the good guys without letting the bad guys learn all of them. And that's an arms race that I hope I can handle. I'd be happy to chat with more about that afterwards. Um, OK, some other stuff we need to ponder. Packaging. Right now, Tor is just a SOX proxy. And you fetch Tor, and you fetch Vidalia. It's a little GUI that tells you whether Tor is working. Um, and there's a little uh, Firefox extension called Tor Button. Um, and you can fetch all of those, but you sort of have to futz with them to make sure they're working. Um, and I, I imagine there are a lot of users out there who haven't configured things quite right. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could give people uh, pre-configured bundles that do everything the right way? One of the ones we've been working on is a Tor Browser Bundle. So it comes with Firefox along with all those other ones. And it's pre-configured correctly so Firefox doesn't spread stuff all over your hard drive. And so it, it doesn't necessarily reveal all the application level uh, worries. And then you can grab this blob and you can stick it on your USB key and you can walk around and connect to the internet cafe. Uh, so that's one approach. There are some other approaches that are based on VMs where um, you're a Windows user. And you, you download this big blob, and you run it in VMware. And it's a Linux kernel that comes with a Tor client and a few other things and some IP tables rules that redirect all the stuff into Tor. So this means that rather than saying, um, Tor is a SOX proxy, so I need to configure every application one at a time, it instead just intercepts all the outgoing TCP streams and shoves them through Tor. Uh, and that makes it a lot less likely that the user is going to screw up. We've also got a live CD that we're working on uh, so that you don't even have to leave any traces on your local system. You just pop in the CD and you either boot from it through a, a, a VM approach or you, you actually restart the computer and you boot from the live CD. Uh, and maybe it runs a Tor client or a server and it's got Firefox and uh, uh, your uh, Pigeon, I guess it's called these days, and what other, whatever other applications you might like. There are some folks in Germany who are working on uh, uh, images for the Linksys WRTG54, the little wireless uh, routers. You can reinstall those with Linux, and you can run a Tor client on those pretty well. And again, it will intercept all the outgoing stuff going out of your wireless connection and shove it into Tor so that it's safe after that. Um, and there's a fellow at Yale who's been working on a Firefox plugin uh, in Java that implements a Tor client. I don't know how far he's gotten. Um, OK, so there are a bunch of other things that we need to work on. Uh, usability is still a big one. It's been on the list for, for many years now. Interfaces, installers, uh, making supporting applications like Vidalia and Tor Button work better. Uh, Windows stability is still an issue. If you run a fast Tor server on a slow, crappy Windows computer, then the Windows computer starts to crash and it all goes bad. Um, so we need to tolerate uh, Microsoft's unique style of networking a little bit better than we do right now. Um, Incentives. Wouldn't it be nice if we could give people better performance if they run a Tor server? So the obvious approach for this, the tit-for-tat approach that BitTorrent uses, is maybe not the right way to do it. Because if I, if I want to attack your traffic, then I'll use you for a long time so that I owe you lots of favors. And then you'll say, OK, and I need a fast connection. Who owes me a favor? Roger owes me a favor. I'll connect through him. So at that point, I just bought the ability to watch the first half of your circuit. That's no good. So I'd like some sort of broader or coarser incentive model. And I've got a few that we've been working on, but, uh, but they're not perfect yet. Um, and then more issues, design for scalability, decentralization. Uh, right now, since every Tor server can connect to every other Tor server, um, first of all, they're all using lots of uh, file descriptors. Because if there are 1,500 servers and they're mostly all connected to each other, then uh, every server out there is using 1,500 file descriptors, which is uh, not good, especially on Windows. Um, so we need some way to maybe uh, make it so that not every server is a link between every other server, or um, hard to say how to work on that. There are some anonymity questions and some uh, scalability questions there. And then research on anonymity and uh, documentation, user support. Uh, we'd love to have your help. If, you, uh, if you're interested in any of the various pieces I've talked about today, uh, there are some professors here who'd like to work with you on stuff, and we'd be happy to help answer questions and um, things like that. So I've got, uh, I think, five and a half minutes for questions. Um, and I'm told you should press the little button on your, uh, on your mic if you have any. 
surely there are a few. Thomas? How much does it add to the latency of a packet? How much does it add, to, add to the latency of a packet? When um, a packet goes directly from source to destination, as opposed to when it goes through. Yeah, um, so that's a fine question. The first answer is we don't know, because we've been busy building stuff rather than measuring it. Uh, but it, it adds quite a bit. If you're on a university network connection, uh, you will notice it a whole lot. If you're on a modem, you won't notice it that much. Uh, so it really uh, depends because, I mean, there are, there are two pieces to it. One of them is you're hopping around the world. So the speed of light is going to uh, add latency to that. And the other piece is um, a lot of the routers are overloaded by all the different streams that, that people are doing. Um, if you look at 1,000 servers and 200,000 users, that's not a very good ratio. Um, so the, the second piece of the latency is queuing inside the routers while they're all waiting to, to be able to send the next packets out. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, there was a study that some folks at Dresden did uh, last year where they showed that the average latency uh, was maybe three seconds, I think, something like that. Um, so if you're downloading a web page and you wait three seconds to get it, that's, some people find that acceptable, some people don't. On the network? Have we tried running file sharing stuff on the network? Uh, we haven't, but some other users have, and we would rather they didn't. Um, part of the challenge, so we were talking earlier about the, the three second thing. Um, part of the challenge, we originally said, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it'll be self limiting because. Once we get slash dotted, then another 100,000 users will arrive, but they'll all say, man, this sucks, and then they'll leave, and it'll become fast enough that, that the remaining users will, will be happy. The problem with that is different classes of users have different tolerance for latency. So the folks who go to sleep with their BitTorrent thing running, they don't care what their latency is, but they're making a lot of web users angry. So there's, there's definitely a challenge here in terms of being able to handle uh, different things. In terms of... so. Uh, Azurius, I believe, has a configuration option to say, dump everything through a tour. Uh, that has led to a, a, a wide amount of grief on our part. But actually, they've recently changed it. So you can say, only download the torrent files through Tor and do the actual data the normal way without Tor. And that's not so bad, because torrent files are uh, a much more reasonable size. Uh, so that means you can stay anonymous from the tracker without destroying the whole Tor network. Um, and that seems like a better move uh, at this point. It would be nice to come up with an anonymity system that could handle terabytes and terabytes of data, um, but we've got a hard enough problem as it is uh, with the one we've got. Um, do, do the countries that uh, have censorship, do they ban uh, encryption by any chance? Or, or like I'm, I'm thinking of the problem of the good allies who volunteers to help. Mm -hmm with censorship, or, we, or are you forced to use steganography with a huge slowdown? So most countries that we've talked to, uh, where they have a pretty good internet connection, they don't ban encryption. Um, China, I mean, you're supposed to use SSL to do e-commerce, and, and they, they can't ban encryption. That would, uh, that would make a lot of corporations very angry. Um, Iran and other places. I mean, SSL is pretty pervasive, so I haven't found any countries that ban encryption. But there are situations where uh, running a Tor client isn't a very smart move. I was talking to some folks from an Eastern Asian communist country a little while ago, and I was explaining, well, uh, here's how crypto works, and here's this great thing called Tor, and you can be anonymous on the internet. And they were getting phone calls in the audience saying, uh, so-and-so just got arrested, what do we do? Uh, and I realized that they needed to learn about operational security, not uh, communication security. Uh, and they were telling me some pretty scary stories, like uh, when I go to the bathroom, somebody breaks into my house and answers my Skype calls. There's a guy across the street with a parabolic microphone listening to everything I say. They steal my laptop and install new hardware and software on it and give it back. Uh, I can't solve that. Uh, but there are plenty of countries that, that really do need tour from a censorship perspective uh, that aren't that badly off. Uh, so. No room for steganography. Um, 
We sort of have, so there are a lot of different notions of steganography. Uh, what we've been working on lately is making Tor's TLS connection, the encryption between, uh, the, the link encryption, look like web browsing. Our goal is to make the Tor client look like a browser, look like Firefox, and the Tor server look like Apache. And that means that just by watching the bytes going back and forth, you can't say, that SSL handshake looks funny, I'm going to hang up on it. Uh, so that's some level of steganography. Um, certainly you can do timing and volume attacks to say, well, he looks like he's logging into a bank, but banks don't usually send this much data back and forth quite like that. Um, but at that point, we're forcing the firewall to, to pay a lot more attention to each TCP stream, and hopefully that, uh, that's an arms race we can win. Question. Um, so, if you do a trace route, for example, for a packet, um, how are you doing units? Trace route for a packet, let's say between A and B, does it show all the Tor servers in the middle or in between? Or Tor transports Tor, Tor, runs Tor only transports TCP streams. So the way it works is you connect to the Tor client, which is a SOX proxy, and you say, "Please connect me to CNN port 80," and it says, after a while, okay, and then you send. Uh, through the TCP stream you've got, get, slash, index, something or other. And it passes those bytes over to the other end and sends them to the web server. So we don't pass IP packets back and forth like TCP, uh, like, like Traceroute uses. We just pass the actual uh, TCP stream back and forth. Um, so you can't Traceroute or ping. So or no, it's not the packets. We actually look at the contents. We look at the at okay. what you say over the TCP connection, and then we pass that to the under, the other end of the Tor network. And that's why you're saying the VM solution is much better because you can encapsulate every packet from any application that comes out of the VM and then send over the um, Tor network. That is a new design that the VM thing is is a piece of, but isn't going to totally do. Because along with running a VM where we intercept everything, we would also need to switch the design of Tor <coughs> over so that it can handle UDP and IP, and so that we're encapsulating packets and moving the actual IP packets to the other side and sending them. And that's, uh, that's harder than it sounds, and it sounds hard. Uh, I actually think it's much easier because um, I kind of do, do similar works. You can, if you do, instead of sending a TCP packet or TCP stream, you send an Ethernet frame over the network then you don't have to deal with um, what's the semantics of this application or what's the semantic of this packet. We're getting closer to being able to do that. Um, some of the challenges are uh, your TCP uh, behavior is going to identify what sort of open BSD and so on you're using. And if we just move the IP packets from one end to the other, then the web server can say, I know what, what sort of user I'm talking to. I, I can learn some about what they're doing. That's one issue. Another issue is, um, exit policies right now uh, just specify addresses and ports. And if we have to specify uh, TCP addresses and TCP ports and UDP addresses and UDP ports and ICMP types this, 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 and this, and BGP no, and, and stuff like that, it gets more complex. Um, and the exit policy needs to tell the client before she picks her exit node whether it's going to support the whole conversation. And if the conversation is a big pile of different types of IP packets, um, it's hard to predict well, how to pick an exit node that will handle that. Uh, we can certainly chat more about that afterwards, because uh, I'd love to do it. I just don't know how. There's a fellow at uh, Waterloo in Canada who is working on this. Uh, and there's another fellow right here who's working on this. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, in time, we'll be able to move to that. Last question, comment? Okay, thank you. <laughs>